The Hunter class frigate will be the most important major surface combatant in the Royal Australian Navy's order of battle, probably until 2050. Displacing 8,800 tons at maximum load, this frigate is larger than a Flight 2 Arleigh Burke destroyer and brings some of the world's most sophisticated anti-submarine warfare systems to battle. An Australianized version of the Type 26 Global Combat Ship, which is currently under construction in the UK and has been selected for the Canadian Navy, these vessels will replace the venerable Anzac-class frigates from the early 2030s. Each ship will be 150 metres long, almost 21 metres wide, have a speed in excess of 27 knots and a crew complement of around 180. By displacement, the nine ship Hunter-class frigates are the largest domestic shipbuilding program in Australia's history. And, as there will be three Hunters for every Hobart-class destroyer, this vessel will arguably be the single most important warship Australia possesses. Wherever the RAN goes on the world's oceans, chances are a Hunter-class will be there. The eight ship Anzac-class frigates are currently the most numerous major surface combatant the RAN possesses. Although now highly capable warships, during their early life the Anzacs were little more than light patrol frigates, both lightly armed and equipped with a reasonably basic sensor suite. During the vessel's selection, Australia's strategic environment was exceptionally benign. In the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the world was dominated by US power, and Australia's wider region was both peaceful and growing in prosperity. Given that context, High-intensity warfighting was not really envisaged as a probable possibility facing the Anzac class. At worst, single ships may be integrated into coalition operations where the substantial firepower of the US Navy would mitigate the threat. Through repeated deployments to the Middle East, it became clear that the very basic, fitted for but not with, weapons and sensor suite posed an unacceptable risk to the Anzac class, specifically their vulnerability to anti-ship missiles. Through a number of upgrade programs, such as ASMD, the Anzacs have evolved into very capable frigates, fielding weapons such as the evolved Sea Sparrow missile, Harpoon Block 2 anti-ship cruise missile, and the world-class Seafire Radar and Illuminator family. However, the choice of a 3,500-ton warship has limited the Anzacs' growth potential, as there is only so much space and weight available for new systems. It was in the announcement of the Anzac class's replacement, C-5000, that a whole new force structure was proposed for the Royal Australian Navy. Not only would the follow-on class be a far larger vessel, but the RAN's whole battle line would not simply undergo a generational upgrade, but would be replaced by a new kind of warship. Essentially, the RAN's 12 frigates would be replaced with 12 destroyers. Both the Adelaide and Anzac class frigates, which displace between 3,500 to 4,000 tons, would be replaced by vessels that were roughly twice the size, in the 7 to 9,000 ton range. The two replacement classes, which eventually became Hunter and Hobart, would be very similar in size, complement, and capability. Both would be highly capable warships across the full range of maritime operations but the Hobart would be more focused on air defence, whilst the Anzac replacement would be a little more capable in anti-submarine warfare. These much larger vessels would be able to field far more weapons, sensors and systems, in addition to having substantial greater growth potential, than the frigates they replaced. Therefore, the RAN's battle line would displace roughly twice the amount it had in the previous generation, and the new warships would be far more suited to high-intensity operations. The new force structure and the new frigate requirements was first outlined in the 2009 Defence White Paper, itself a reflection of Canberra's growing anxiety around its strategic environment. Driven by decades of historic economic growth, China has embarked on one of the greatest naval shipbuilding programs in modern history, constructing the equivalent of the French Navy in just four years. This military expansion has led to full-blown strategic competition between Beijing and Washington, and for the first time in over 50 years, Australia faces the prospect of general regional conflict in the Indo-Pacific. These trends, already evident in the first decade of this century, are the basic reason for the drastic increase in the size of the RAN's vessels. Additionally, given Australia's potential vulnerability to trade interdiction and the increasing sophistication and capability of Beijing's submarine fleet, the desire for a world-class anti-submarine warfare capability is the foundation of the Hunter-class project. Three designs were considered for the C-5000 program, 
Although each of the tenders proposed either operational or already ordered foreign warships, each had to be substantially modified to meet Australian requirements. Specifically, the CFAR-2 radar and illuminator family, the Aegis combat system and standard missile 2. Additionally, all nine vessels would be constructed at the ASC shipyard in Adelaide. The first, submitted by the Spanish shipbuilder Navantia, was essentially a modified Hobart class. Called the F-5000, the Navantia proposal took the Hobart's hull, complete with its 48-cell Mark 41 VLS complex and fundamental layout, and added the new radar and sonar systems. This vessel had 75% commonality with the Hobart class and could leverage the already existing relationships between Navantia and Australian industry. The fact that Navantia submitted a Hobart class with only minor modifications shows just how similar the requirements for the Hobart and Hunter classes are. Fincantieri submitted a modified version of the Frem ASW frigate, currently in service with the Italian Navy as the Bergamini class. Although the smallest of the tenders, the Italian option was the only vessel with two dedicated hangars, allowing for the routine deployment of a pair of ASW helicopters. The Frem was also a mature design, with eight active examples in the Italian Navy alone. The final option was BAE's Global Combat Ship, currently under production as the Royal Navy's Type 26 frigate. Although clearly the option with the greatest risk, given there was no active examples afloat during the tender process, the Type 26 was easily the most modern vessel. Its advanced electric drive and hull design make it the quietest of the contenders, giving it the greatest potential ASW capability. At 150 meters in length and with a maximum displacement of over 8,000 tons, it was also the largest option. On the 28th of June, 2018, the Australian Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, announced that BAE had won the tender and the Hunter class was born. HMAS Hunter will be a modified version of the Royal Navy's Type 26 City Class Frigate, featuring a number of large-scale design revisions. Although the fundamental layout of the vessel is very similar, its primary sensors, weapons, combat system and tactical interface will all be changed to meet Australian specifications. The Hunter class will still maintain the Type 26's exceptionally quiet hull and propulsion system and share its primary sonar systems. However, it will feature the Australian designed CFAR 2 radar and illuminator family, the Aegis combat system, and the Saab 9LV tactical interface. Forward of the bridge, the Hunter will feature a 32 cell Mark 41 VLS complex and a Mark 45 5 inch gun. Amidships, they will deploy two phalanx close in weapon systems and eight canister launched anti ship missiles. The rear of the vessel features a large, Chinook capable flight deck and dedicated hangar space for a single helicopter. Forward of the hangar is the flexible mission bay, which can handle up to 10 20 foot containers, four additional 11 meter RHIB fast boats, or potentially even a second helicopter. The Hunter will have a substantial range in excess of 7,000 nautical miles and can, obviously, be refueled at sea. Undeniably, the greatest capability enhancement the Hunter class will provide the ADF is in the area of anti-submarine warfare. The Hunters will be exceptionally dangerous opponents for hostile submarines. The first element in the Hunter's design characteristics, which will make it such a capable ASW platform, is its stealth. Like the rest of the global combat ship family, the Hunter class will be exceptionally quiet warships, a trait which makes them difficult for enemy submarines to both detect and track. The hull shape itself is specifically designed to reduce the vessel's acoustic signature. However, the main method of reducing the vessel's self-noise is the propulsion system. The Hunter will use a combined diesel, electric or gas system, which is inherently quiet at cruising speeds. The two propeller shafts are each directly driven by an electric motor, which is powered by diesel generators. This is opposed to the more typical method of propulsion, where the ship's diesel engines drive the propellers mechanically via a gearbox and drive shaft. Because there is no mechanical connection between the diesel motors and propeller shafts, the generators can be acoustically isolated from the hull, drastically reducing the amount of noise the ship emits. As electric propulsion is inherently quiet, this makes the Type 26 family very stealthy when operating at cruising speeds. The ship's electricity needs are met by four MTU diesel generators, which each deliver over 3000 kilowatts of mechanical power. At high speeds, the Hunter will be propelled by a Rolls-Royce MT-30 gas turbine, which is mechanically connected to the drive shaft, providing a top speed in excess of 27 knots. This system combines low speed stealth with high speed performance, by allowing the vessel to switch between drive modes. 
The second major ASW capability improvement the Hunter class provides, and the one that will be truly revolutionary for the Royal Australian Navy, is the sonar suite. Specifically, the Thales 2087 Low Frequency Active Variable Depth Toad Ray Sonar. To explain why this system is so revolutionary, we first need to understand how warships, western warships anyway, engage submarines. Typically warships rely on passive sonar for long-range submarine detection, usually in the form of a towed array. These sonar systems are a number of highly sensitive hydrophones that are towed some distance away from the warship, removing the ship's noise, and can pick up very faint acoustic signatures emitted from submarines. Because of the way sound propagates in the ocean, passive sonar can have a very long range, potentially hundreds of nautical miles depending on the conditions. Low frequency sounds, in particular, can travel a very long distance through the ocean because it suffers from a very small amount of transmission loss. Once a submarine has been detected by a passive towed array system, the vessel can direct other ASW assets, such as a dipping sonar equipped helicopter or maritime patrol aircraft, to more precisely locate and identify the submarine. These assets may use more precise sonar systems, such as mid-frequency active sonar, to fix the target and generate a firing solution. For decades, passive towed array systems have been a critical long-range, wide-area anti-submarine surveillance capability and have been the bedrock of the Western ASW kill chain. In general terms, Russian and Chinese submarines have historically been far more noisy than their Western counterparts, and the sophistication and sensitivity of Western passive sonars gave them a substantial technological advantage. However, with the latest generation of Russian, and to a lesser extent Chinese, submarines, this acoustic advantage has been waning. Throughout the end of the Cold War period, the Soviets began investing heavily in signature reduction techniques, and by the introduction of the Akula class, an estimated 30 decibel self-noise reduction had been achieved over earlier systems such as the Victor-1. Although Western passive sonar systems have become even more sensitive since then, Relying on long-range passive detection for very quiet submarines becomes more and more difficult because of something called the noise floor. The ocean itself has its own internal noise which is generated by the wind and waves, biology, commercial maritime traffic, and even geology. This creates a background noise which fills the ocean across multiple frequencies. In fact, the low frequency noise produced by all of the large commercial vessels will form a low frequency background noise that can fill an entire ocean basin. What this means for passive sonar is, the closer your target signal level is to the background noise, the harder it will be to detect, even if you have a more sensitive hydrophone. Although advanced signal processing has improved the performance of passive sonar systems against very quiet targets, these submarines are still often able to approach to uncomfortably small ranges before they are detected. The primary solution to this problem, the degradation of a warship's wide area undersea surveillance capability, is the invention of low frequency active sonar. Like all active sonars, low frequency active systems emit acoustic energy into the water, like a ping, and then listen for the return signal. They emit very low frequency sound, usually below 1 kHz, often in a deep area of the water column called the SOFAR channel. Because low frequency sound is absorbed much more slowly in the ocean, it can travel much farther than the medium frequency systems which are currently in use. However, for shorter range targets, medium to high frequency active sonars are much more efficient, which is why low frequency systems have not, generally, been invested in historically. Basically, the further the distance, the lower the optimum frequency for target detection. The 2087 sonar suite combines a traditional passive towed array system with a dedicated low frequency variable depth transmission array, which is actually quite large. The transmitter is towed behind the ship and lowered to the target depth where it begins low frequency transmissions. Echoes are then collected by the passive array, allowing for very long range detection of even the quietest submarines. Obviously, the passive towed array is still a critical element of the system, as low frequency active is designed to supplement, rather than replace, passive systems. The 2087 system is currently one of the most advanced sonar suites active anywhere. 
In combination, the Hunter's stealth and advanced sonar systems will make it one of the most capable anti-submarine warfare vessels in the world. The low frequency active and passive arrays will enable the long range detection of hostile submarines at great distances. And its hull mounted ultra electronic sea searcher sonar, the same system as used by the Hobart class, will enable close to medium range target prosecution with both medium frequency active and passive modes. The Sea Searcher also provides acoustic torpedo detection and mine avoidance capability. Detecting the enemy submarine before it either locates you or approaches close enough to be a threat is the name of the game. And when teamed with the dipping sonar equipped MH60 Romeo Seahawk, each armed with the MU-90 impact torpedo, virtually every submarine currently active in the world today will struggle to achieve a detection advantage against the Hunter. Compared to the Anzac class they will replace, the Hunter class represent a quantum leap in ASW capability. Although these vessels are designated as anti-submarine warfare ships, this really is a misnomer. Much like the Hobart class, which is substantially more than an air warfare destroyer, the Hunter will be very capable across the full spectrum of maritime warfare operations. Indeed, in terms of air defense, the Hunters come close to matching the Hobart's formidable capability. The Hunter class will deploy the world-class CIFAR-2 air defense radar and illuminator family. The original CIFAR is an Australian-designed and manufactured active electronically scanned array, or AESA, radar, and currently equips the Anzac class frigate. AESA radars use an array of transmit-receive modules, or elements, each like a miniature radar, which electronically steer the beam, and the CIFAR-2 system uses world-leading gallium nitride technology. AESA radars have exceptionally fast scan rates, allowing them to conduct huge volume search in near real time, in addition to three-dimensional tracking. They are also generally more sensitive than mechanical or PESA systems. The CIFAR-1 system, as deployed on the ANZAC class, is an S-band air search radar that consists of six radar faces arrayed to provide 360 degrees of continual sensor coverage. This system is paired with the C-mount AESA-based missile illuminator, which is technologically superior to the Mark 82 missile director used on the Hobart-class destroyer and other Aegis ships. C-mount can steer the illumination beam almost instantly, allowing for simultaneous missile direction from multiple weapons. The CIFAR-2 system is currently being integrated into the ANZAC class. Operating in the L-band and using gallium nitride technology, CIFAR-2 provides both a very high power output and a very long range giving the Anzac class frigate a comparable radar capability to the Hobart class. The CFAR system is composed of a single tile, which is a standard size containing the same number of transmit received modules, 64 in total, which are then combined to make radar faces. The larger the face, the larger the number of tiles and the greater the power output. This makes the CFAR system both modular and scalable. According to Ian Crosser at CEA Technologies, the Hunter class CFAR radar will operate in the S and L band and have a total of 20 different radar faces. The S-band part of the system will contain a total of 64 different AESA radar tiles and some 4,096 different elements. With each different radar face, tile, and even element able to act independently, the radar as a whole will be able to conduct dozens of different tasks simultaneously, such as the long range track of dozens of targets in addition to simultaneous volume search. Now, a proven technology through the ANZAC class ASMD upgrade program, CIFAR truly is a globally leading radar technology comparable to the most advanced systems in the world. In terms of air defense weapons, the Hunter class is, again, only just shy of the Hobart's capability. Forward of the bridge is a 32 cell Mark 41 VLS complex, which houses the Hunter's primary air defense armament. For long range air defense, the Hunter class will deploy the SM2 Block 3 surface to air missile. The SM-2 is a highly capable weapon system, which is designed to provide wide area air defense against threats such as aircraft, helicopters, and anti-ship missiles. It has a range of around 90 nautical miles and a top speed in excess of Mark III. The weapon combines a semi-active radar homing seeker, requiring illumination from the warship, with an infrared element, allowing dual mode target prosecution. Although designed to improve the SM-2's resistance to electronic countermeasures, the infrared seeker can automatically acquire the target without illumination if required. The SM-2 can also be used in a short-range anti-surface roll. The other primary area air defense weapon is the Evolved Sea Sparrow Missile, or ESSM, which is currently the RAN's most prolific air defense weapon. Deployed on both the Anzac-class frigate and Hobart-class destroyer, 
The ESSM is a medium range air defense missile with a total engagement envelope of around 50 kilometers. This range is more than the radar horizon for sea skimming or even low flying targets. The ESSM uses a similar semi-active radar homing seeker to the SM2, effectively making it a miniature version and is specifically designed to engage high speed and maneuvering targets such as supersonic anti-ship missiles. Because the ESSM is so much smaller than the SM2, four can be quad packed into a single VLS cell. This feature greatly enhances the hunter's potential missile load. For example, with eight cells containing 32 ESSMs, an additional 24 SM2s can be deployed, providing a total of 56 weapons. This surface-to-air missile capacity gives the hunter a truly valuable wide area air defense capability. In terms of close range anti-ship missile defense, the Hunter will field the ubiquitous Phalanx close-in weapon system and the Australian designed Nulka electronic decoy. Directed by a dedicated KU band fire control radar and an infrared system, the Phalanx's 20mm Vulcan Gatling gun is capable of a rate of fire in excess of 4,000 rounds per minute. Two of these systems, one on each side of the vessel, will provide the Hunter with nearly 360 degrees of Phalanx coverage. These vessels will also deploy the Australian-designed Nulka active decoy. Using hovering rocket technology, the Nulka decoy flies some distance away from the ship and emulates its electromagnetic signature, providing a high-quality phantom target for the vessel. The Nulka system is much more effective than simple chaff and is similar technology to the towed decoys used by tactical fighters. With the SM2 on board, the Hunter can certainly fill the role of wide area air defense if there is no Hobart class present and will certainly add to the fleet's area air defense capability. Although only equipped with 32 VLS cells, meaning 16 less than Hobart, something to consider is the Hunter's room for growth in terms of air defense. Given the Hunter class's size and displacement, there is almost certainly a weight, space, and buoyancy reserve for the addition of further 8-cell Mark 41 VLS segments if this is required. Although it's impossible to be sure without details of Hunter's internal layout, it may be possible for an additional two strike length segments where the current Mark 41 complex is, given the size of the Foxal. Even if this was not possible, a smaller tactical length Mark 41 VLS segment can be placed on the deck in a similar fashion to the FFG up program on the Adelaide class. As the RAN is very unlikely to abandon the ESSM given its affinity for this weapon, in fact, it will probably be replaced with the ESSM Block 2 active radar guided variant. Removing the smaller missile from the strike length cells would certainly allow for the deployment of much larger weapons. If these segments were added, bringing the total up to 48, Hunter would be every bit as capable as the Hobart in terms of air defense. In the surface warfare role, the Hunter class will be equipped with the ubiquitous Mark 45 5 inch naval gun and 8 anti ship missiles. Although the 5-inch gun has been the mainstay of naval shore bombardment and close-range anti-shipping for decades, it is about to undergo a rapid transformation via the introduction of highly advanced munitions. Originally developed for the electromagnetic railgun program, this shell, called the hypervelocity projectile or gun-launched guided projectile, has now been adapted for use in both 5-inch and 155mm gun systems. This projectile contains both guidance and maneuvering sections, meaning it effectively acts as a small hit-to-kill missile. When fired out of a 5-inch gun, the shell is accelerated to speeds in excess of Mark III, greatly increasing its range and lethality through kinetic energy transfer. This weapon is highly capable of engaging anti-ship cruise missiles, in fact, even terminal phase ballistic missiles, and will provide both low-cost and high magazine capacity. Additionally, in the anti-surface role, this weapon will greatly increase the 5-inch gun's range, although the kinetic warhead is unsuited for area targets. With the future introduction of this new projectile, the 5-inch gun will become a core warfighting system once again. Currently, the RAN plans to equip the Hunter class with eight canister-launched anti-ship cruise missiles in a similar fashion to the Mark 141 quad harpoon launchers currently deployed on RAN warships. The Harpoon has served the RAN for many decades, but the weapon is now approaching the end of its service life and will be replaced on the Hunter class and throughout the fleet with more advanced systems. Although the ADF has not specified which weapon will replace the Harpoon, and therefore this discussion contains a good deal of speculation, currently there are two likely contenders, the Long Range Anti-Ship Missile, or LRASM, and the Naval Strike Missile, or NSM. 
The Norwegian Naval Strike Missile is a weapon which is already operational with the Norwegian military and will be deployed on future United States Navy warships. It is a stealthy, subsonic anti-ship cruise missile with a surface launched range of around 100 nautical miles. The LRASM is an anti-shipping variant of the JASSM-ER cruise missile and is currently being integrated with the RAAF Super Hornet fleet. The weapon has an air-launched engagement range of around 400 nautical miles or 740 kilometers. Both the LRASM and NSM are highly lethal anti-ship missiles, which combine a very low radar cross-section with passive sensors. Unlike the Harpoon, both missiles use passive electronic and terminal infrared sensors to acquire and track enemy warships, meaning they give off no electromagnetic signals which can be detected. In combination, these features make these weapons very hard to detect and engage by shipboard defenses. In effect, by utilizing stealth, the LRASM and NSM achieve the same effect as supersonic anti-ship missiles, compressing the time defensive systems have to react and engage the weapon. The NSM is a low-risk, off-the-shelf weapon that is already operational, as opposed to the LRASM which is still under development, as the air-launched variant is only just in active service. However, the LRASM is a larger, more modern, and generally more capable weapon. The LRASM not only has a greater range, it is also much more destructive, deploying a 1,000-pound brooch warhead. Considering how capable enemy defensive systems are, when engaging capital ships like an aircraft carrier, the ability to cripple an enemy vessel with one successful hit is a greater advantage than it was in the previous generation of ASCMs. The LRASM includes advanced targeting software, allowing for autonomous attack profile selection and adjustment. The missile will evaluate the enemy defensive posture by identifying defensive systems and then choose the best attack profile, including altitude, all without any external input. There is some reason to believe that the RAN will end up going with the LRASM. Not only is the weapon deployed by the RAAF, but Thales Australia is now teaming up with Lockheed Martin specifically to aid in the development of the surface launch variant called the LRASM SL. Additionally, under this agreement, both parties intend to develop an Australian domestic missile manufacturing capability meaning there is a good chance that an LRASM production line will be set up in Australia. Given the advanced capability of the weapon, the commonality with the RAAF and the possibility of local manufacture, this is surely an attractive option for the RAN. However, we simply won't know until the ADF announces its decision. This array of different sensors and weapons will be controlled and coordinated by the Aegis combat system. The world's first complete battle management system, and arguably still the premier combat system in the world, Aegis takes all of the information generated by the vessel's various sensors, such as sonars, radars, and data links, and forges a coherent and complete picture of the battle space. Aegis is capable of automatically tracking and classifying hundreds of airborne, surfaced, and submerged targets, and can then rapidly engage them with the ship's various weapons. The core of the Hunter's combat system will be the Aegis Command and Decision System and Weapons Control System. The Aegis Display System will be replaced by the Australian-designed and manufactured Saab 9LV Tactical Interface, which is currently used on the Anzac class. The Saab Tactical Interface has been specifically designed to meet Australian requirements. Through cooperative engagement capability, the Hunter class will be able to share targeting data with other Keck-equipped vessels such as the Hobart class destroyers, allowing both the cooperative engagement of hostile targets and over-the-horizon missile shots. Again, in terms of the capabilities of its combat system, the Hunter class is absolutely the equal of the Hobart class air warfare destroyer. When the Hunter class began rolling off the production line in the early 2030s, the RAN surface fleet will be in the final stages of the transformation first envisaged in the 2009 Defence White Paper. The RAN's battle line will now consist of, effectively, an all-destroyer force composed of warships that are truly capable of engaging in high-end naval warfare with the greatest naval powers on Earth. Often the term frigate is confusing, as people tend to consider a frigate as a less capable vessel compared to a destroyer. But this is no longer the case. The reason the Hunter class are designated as frigates, rather than destroyers, is their primary role, anti-submarine warfare. They are every bit as capable as the Hobart class across the full spectrum of naval combat, including air defense. A future RAN task force consisting of a Hobart class destroyer and two Hunter class frigates 
will be able to provide a formidable area of local sea control with two low frequency active sonars supported by the Hobart sophisticated passive towed array systems, even the world's most capable submarines will be reliably detected at long range, allowing for joint engagement by assets such as the MH60 Romeo Seahawk helicopter and P-8 Poseidon. Operating in a network enabled by cooperative engagement capability, all three vessels will conduct an integrated air battle effectively acting as one larger, integrated air defense system. This ability to generate common target tracks and common missile direction will greatly increase the efficiency of the task force's air defense capability. This will only be further enhanced with weapons such as the SM-6, which provide the task force with an over-the-horizon engagement capability. Equipped with lethal anti-ship weapons, such as the LRASM, enemy warships can effectively be engaged at very long range. Although this may sound like an exaggeration, to say that the Hunter will be a world-class warship is probably an understatement. They are likely to be one of the most capable major surface combatants active anywhere in the world, able to engage in the full spectrum of maritime warfare at the very highest level. The combination of an excellent hull and propulsion system from the United Kingdom, a world-leading sonar suite from Europe, the most capable currently operational battle management system from the United States, and cutting-edge radar and illumination systems from Australia, will make the Hunter class far more than the sum of its parts. Arguably, the only weakness is its relatively small VLS capacity, but this may be redressed through later upgrades. In their primary role of anti-submarine warfare, they will have very few equals. Aptly named Hunter, these warships will prowl the world's oceans, stalking their submerged prey, protecting both Australia's trade and its capital ships. Truly, they will be the foundation of Australian naval power throughout the first half of this century.